ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa will today wrap up the party's manifesto review in Alberton in Gauteng. This review is a crucial part of the party's preparations for the upcoming 2024 elections. The ANC has emphasized that this review is all about being accountable to the people, considering the mandate the party received in the 2019 general elections. Let's listen in to what Ramaphosa has to say. Honestly, about our performance on delivery and the various priorities that we set out for ourselves has both been humbling as well as uplifting for us because members of the ANC and supporters and members of communities uh, spoke openly and they, they came up with uh, quite a lot of criticisms uh, but they also underpinned that with putting forward views and suggestions and proposals of how we can do better. So in many ways, they became our mirror that enabled us as the ANC to look at ourselves and to see how best we can improve on a number of areas. Uh, relation to the economy, for instance, uh, unemployment and how we should continue to tackle unemployment on health matters, talking about the NHI, and also on crime and corruption. They spoke openly about that as well. And a whole range of other processes, gender-based violence, where they wanted and thought that we should tighten things up, our own interventions. And with all that, we've been able to garner to get quite a lot of valuable uh, inputs and feedback which will enable us to craft a manifesto for the 2024 elections. So we felt that we should not just base our next manifesto process on uh, a vacuum, on uh, something that is not practical. We felt that we should underpin that by having heard what our people said. It was a brilliant suggestion from the SGO embraced by the officials, the NWC and NEC, and all of us have been engrossed in this whole process. It started off at national level, then cascaded it down, uh, right down to the regional level. So we've had the movement abuzz with talking about the manifesto. We're now going to do it bottoms up again when the new manifesto will be drafted and uh, it will culminate with us launching our manifesto uh, next year. Uh, and when we do launch it, we will be absolutely certain that uh, we will have uh, based it on what is doable, what is achievable, and what is also based on the lived experience of our people. So for us, this review process has been part of uh, adding to the renewal process and uh, renewing the ANC, but it has also been aimed at reconnecting the ANC with our base, uh, not only our membership, our supporters, as well as uh, members of the community at large. And it is for that reason that we've been overjoyed. The categories of people who've been involved in this have actually been most impressive. It has not only been ANC members, it has been people from the religious sector, uh, traditional leaders, sports people, artists and uh, performers, uh, academics uh, have been involved in this whole process. And we, we really are humbled with the manner in which they, they delved into this uh, and meetings that I've participated in, uh, the community engagement meetings that's, part, that's been part of the review process, have actually been uh, enriching. And uh, uh, it is through that that we feel a lot stronger uh, to be able to uh, finalize uh, manifesto and uh, start an election campaign uh, which we will be participating in uh, on a very, very good foundation.
foundation of real solid information where we've just not plucked issues out of our heads to make them into priorities of our manifesto, but there will be things that are based on the lived experience of our people. So this has been a very good process to actually crown it all with a wrap-up like this, uh, which uh, is drumming up, obviously, the enthusiasm of, of, of our members. And let me end by saying, uh, even in rallies where people have participated, uh, I've been heartened to see the great enthusiasm that's still there, residing in our communities, residing in many places where the ANC uh, has a footprint. And it's been a very, very powerful footprint. And the review process has really been a good one. So thank you for being here. And uh, I now am ready to ask you questions. Maybe you want to ask first. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Comrade President. I am now going to open it up for that engagement. We call it a media engagement for a reason. Um, I don't know whether to start with the one that is looking right at, um, at, at the President, but uh, may I hear it from uh, members of the media who wishes to give it a go? Moluku? or SABC or ENCA. I see two hands there. Start with uh, Zwai and then I will move to Moluku. And may I also request that in order to enable everyone to have their peace, we just start with uh, the initial question first. And we don't uh, amplify it into five questions at a go. Uh, we know how we conduct ourselves in these things. But uh, over to you, Zwai. Okay, um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's Mzwande Limbeji from the SAPC. Um, you know, when I was preparing to come here, engaging with a number of uh, colleagues and ordinary people to tell them where I was going, you know, someone said, is it even necessary? And then I said, why? He said, because uh, the issues, the problems, the challenges, uh, the, everyone can see them. So we know what those challenges and problems are. So what is it that the ANC has found new uh, from these engagements? Because we know the problem we're having is load shedding, water cuts, potholed roads, a rail that is not working. I know there are attempts to try to get it back. So basically, the issues are there for all to see. So you don't even need a thorough process to look at them because they are well known. I'm just going to take ENCA and then allow the president space to just ventilate those two questions. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. President. Thank you. My name is Moluko Muloto from uh, ENCA. I have four questions, but I'll stick to one as per the directive for now. The, as I was listening to the chairperson of the ANC Electoral uh, Committee, Mr. Halema Mutlante, he talked about the importance of appointing or se selecting candidates who will go to parliament and hold the executive accountable. You might have uh, seen uh, the remarks um, by the Public Enterprises Portfolio Committee who expressed their unhappiness and disquiet over Minister Pravin Gordon because he hasn't uh, agreed to furnish them with the documents which would speak to the SAA Takatsu deal. In the name of accountability and transparency, given the fact that Parliament is the body that's empowered by legislation to hold you and your national executive accountable, what do you make of uh, Minister Pravin Godan's refusal seemingly to uh, com uh, participate in that process by giving out those uh, particular papers? Mizrahi, yes, I think we will all testify to the fact that the challenges that our country faces are known. And they are known. But I don't see any harm in continuing to talk about them. Because that in many ways gives us different perspectives of how people approach the various issues. I will give you a very good example. 
challenge of water is known that we have a challenge of water we are in a water or live in a water scarce country but the lived experience of different people in our country is what people need to have freedom to articulate and there's just no way that I'm going to say because the problem of water is known they must be muzzled they must not talk about it nor should we talk about it it is out of talking about issues that we are able to find solutions one could even have said well the problem of apartheid was known from 1948 so why did we need to continue talking about it and we did continue talking about it to mobilize our people to get our people to focus on freeing themselves and to get our people to talk about it to strengthen the hand and the arm of the ANC and other organizations to fight against this evil so much as it is known that there's a water problem it was important for me to go to Josini to go to a village I had never been to to go and hear the actual manifestation of the water problem and challenge that that community was going through and why it was important for them to advocate the installation of a pipe from the Josini dam to traverse up to 50 something kilometers to come to them it was important so ordinarily you would have said ah oh, but it's known I mean why do we talk about it we talk about it because we've got to deal with the lived experience of our people similarly you could say why talk about unemployment unemployment is the number one challenge that we all face but giving perspectives giving a clear perspective of how it affects uh, a graduate and how it affects <clears throat> somebody who's uneducated is is very uh, contemporary contextual we must talk about it over and over and over again until it is done until the problem is solved so I would have said to those people and you say there are many people who you spoke to and your colleagues I would have said uh, so I, it's important for you to come here to hear uh, what it is that we are talking about and what perspectives our people have put forward about how these challenges affect them uh, with regard to the SAA Takaso deal I, I noted what the parliamentary or the portfolio committee said uh, and of course uh, things have to be done openly and transparently and all that uh, there are some times where when transactions are done uh, so that they don't disturb uh, the closure of those transactions there are certain things that as said uh, should uh, be communicated at certain times and in this regard I don't think that uh, the absence of whatever information that they needed uh, is something that testifies to uh, an underhand process uh, a devious process that's underway I think the minister has been fairly straightforward uh, in articulating the various broad parameters of the transaction but I would I would say to the minister minister go and meet the committee and uh, outline to the committee uh, the various uh, issues that are they are they are concerned about because there's nothing to hide the minister should be able to go and explain and uh, if certain things are so confidential as to lead to the collapse of the transaction it should be said so uh, because that's what often happens people sign nine, sign nine disclosure agreements they sign confidential agreements but we have to say that this is a public asset so there's uh, quite a bit of information that needs to be put on the table 
And I don't believe and refuse to believe and will not allow it that uh, there should be uh, underhand type of uh, details uh, that uh, make people so suspicious. So information uh, to the extent that it complies with the various agreements that have been reached should be put on the table. So I'll encourage the minister to go and engage uh, with that committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade President. Um, I will just uh, prioritize a woman over there, Kenny, and, and then I saw other colleagues who wish to speak. Um, so I'll come this way. Can I start with yourself, Kenny? Okay, thank you, uh, Sis Matlenge. It's Kenny Mapanga from SABC News. Um, I would like to get a research um, response on the Human Sciences Research Council. Um, they looked at the youth intention and perceptions ahead of the 2024 polls. And if you look at the youth distrust in the core political institutions, it's the highest in Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal. And if I can give you an example, in the national government, it starts at 83% in KZN and 80% in Gauteng. And then when they looked at the three main reasons why the youth does not intend to vote, and the most cited is the party performance, that is the ANC's party performance, uh, poor government performance, a lack of change, service delivery, and then there's that big factor of disillusionment, uh, saying that it makes no difference for them to vote. How does the ANC intend to tackle this perception among the youth in the 2024 polls? Thank you very much, SABC. Um, then over to Power. Uh, good day, guys. Kosnati Shazi from Power FM News. Firstly, an honor to finally speak to you, Mr. President. Um, so at the conclusion of the 55th National Conference in NASRAC, organizational renewal was of top priority for the African National Congress. Last week, the ANC SG, Figile Mbalula, hosted um, a, a press briefing at Lutuli House in which he called for some members of the ANC Veterans League to stop decampaigning the organization and use appropriate channels uh, uh, to express how they feel. Uh, I think a day later, or 24 hours later, Deputy President of the Youth League, Kuma Vusum Simang, tendered his resignation. On the 12th of December, the ANC SG met with Uma Vuso and he since withdrew his resignation. So um, my question to you, Mr. President, um, the handling of this matter, the handling um, of this, is this part of organization renewal? Because you did mention that the ANC is striving for victory and all the leagues are strong. In July, you guys elected new leadership for the Youth League, the Women's League, and the Veterans League. So um, the handling of those public spats between uh, 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 the Veterans League and the mother body, um, was that properly handled in your opinion? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take the third question so that we save time. This is set for an hour, um, so I'm counting, and I think we do need to make it count. So I'm going to take, uh, as a dare yourself, Norman, or Siam Tanda. Yes, please go ahead. Siam Tanda Kappa from News24. Mr. President, I know that uh, it's been said that you're not going to make the performance assessments of your ministers public. Um, you've just spoken now about information being put on the table well, with regards to SA. Are you happy with the performance of your ministers and deputy ministers? Could you please just... Thank you very much. May I stretch uh, yourself, President, a bit? Because um, I just see a number of hands. Maybe take one last one. My brother... Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, Mr. President. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, session. You gave us a holiday, then you took it away from <laughs> <some of> us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you and us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, having conducted this process that you were talking about, uh, uh, President, uh, being uh, humbled and uplifted and uh, hearing the criticism from the people, what is your assessment of your government? Um, what is your assessment of the performance of your government? And would you, um, if you were a normal citizen like me, would you vote for the ANC again, given the failures that you've just spoken about? And can I squeeze in one last one? Uh, one friend? question at a time. Okay. And you did not introduce yourself, bro? Oh, sorry, my apologies. My name is Sibong Awonke from the Sunday Times. Thank you, Shoba. Um, we will then pause there. Um, after that, I'll come to News 24 as well as Eyewitness. And yeah, over to you, President. Uh, let me start with the last one. Um, having heard you were saying 
uh, we received this review with humility and uh, uh, we're very pleased that our people had an opportunity to assess uh, our performance in relation to the, the manifesto's uh, implementation. Would I vote for the ANC? Of course I would. You must expect that I would. <laughs> uh, there have been, yes, successes. And sometimes, you know, when, when we do these assess assessments, we, we don't talk about areas where there's been positive outcomes. Uh, and I guess for yourselves as the media, you always want to focus on the negatives. Uh, there have been successes, areas where the successes have been noticed by our people and have said, we're grateful, we're happy that you've done A, B, C, D. And that does not mean there haven't been weaknesses. That does not mean there haven't been failures. Because... Uh, in life, in life, it never happens that you get uh, everything A, 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 A. There will be areas where there are weaknesses, there will be areas where there are uh, failures. But on balance, when you weigh up everything, we are finding that there have been more uh, breakthroughs, more successes. When we launched the manifesto, we actually said, Yes, there have been successes in a number of areas, and there's work in progress in many more, which would, in color terms, be uh, categorized as yellow, and the others would be green, and the others would be red, where there's work not having been done. And as we count, and I'm not going to count all this for you, we have found that there has been enormous, enormous uh, achievement and progress. Even if you don't look at it from, you know, just a five-year period, you look at it from a 30-year period. I was reading uh, a column by Stephen Friedman, uh, who is one of the leading analysts in the country, and he was saying, those who say that there hasn't been progress in South Africa are simply not telling the truth. And that is the reality. Has there been weaknesses? Yes. And we admit that. We testify to that. Have there been failures? Yes, there have been. But the successes, the progress, far outweighs areas where there has been weaknesses. And when you look at some of the challenges that we've had just in the past five years, COVID, floods, unrest, load shedding, logistics. And if you look at that, the common thread that runs through it all is that the government has been responding to each one. Unemployment, the unemployment levels, uh, well, the economy first, the economy has gone back to pre-COVID levels. Unemployment has gone back to pre-COVID levels. We lost, officially we say we lost 2 million jobs. But in reality, we did lose more than 2 million jobs during COVID. And many countries around the world are still trying to recover from that COVID uh, damage. What have we been doing? We've been working throughout this period to restore the jobs. We've created 1,200 opportunities. If you go to our schools today, there's not even a single school where you will go to where either teachers, students, parents will not applaud the way in which we have brought young people into schools to assist in schools, administrations, delivery of the curriculum, and they're just overjoyed. We've got 25,000 schools, and we've infused well over 800,000 people in th those areas. In agriculture, we have, for the first time in a long time, given people capability to farm seeds, fertilizers, and that has impact on the lives of more than 40,000 people. Uh, when you look at, for instance, education, uh, 
to have risen from 60,000 that we assisted in 1994 today to 800,000. Nzimande actually says, President, it's more than that. It's 1.2 million. And I say, I'll stick to 800,000. Because we're paying out 48 billion rand a year to support the education of our young people. Many of our schools no longer pay fees. No fee schools. When I went to school, my parents paid fees. In other countries, as I talk to other presidents, they say, yes, they still have to pay fees. We now have no fee schools. Healthcare is another area. The number of clinics that have been built throughout are huge. Now, of course, we're dealing now with the problem of, of potholes. They're potholes because, yes, infrastructure, we've seen a decline in investment in infrastructure. The gross uh, capital fixed investment has been sliding down from both the private sector side and the public sector side. And we're trying to reboost that. And one of the things that I think has set us now on a course of better delivery and addressing the needs of our people is now to have come up with, if you listen to the medium term policy budget statement, you should have read the line where the minister has said, we will now be embarking on funding mechanisms, innovative and new funding mechanisms to fund projects and infrastructure where we are going to work more closely with the private sector. Our fiscus, our budget, 60% of it is for social welfare, which leaves you with 40% for real investment, even less than that, into the economy. We've had to come up with new innovative funding mechanisms to be able to fund social infrastructure, to build the roads, to build more hospitals, more clinics, more universities, and more houses. I referred in my general input to just Northern Cape. And when you look at it, you say, if we don't come up with a new funding mechanism, they're going to wait for 50 years until we get rid of our informal settlements. But now we've embarked on a new funding mechanism, which is going to enable Zamani Sol to launch a billion rand housing project next year in January, because we now have a new funding mechanism. If we didn't have that, we would have waited. Where has this funding mechanism come? It has come out of discussions, change of approach, change of doing things, and making sure that we do uh, indeed uh, begin the process of getting things to change around. Now, would I vote for the ANC with that in mind? Yes, I would. Because I would say your experience as the ANC, where you've made mistakes, where you've hit some issues very, very on the mark, tells me that you have learned a lot of lessons along the way. You are now going to be able to correct a number of things. I also spoke about uh, unspent budgets. Realized that there's something like up to 20 billion rand that goes unspent. We now say we're focusing on that. No entity must say we couldn't spend the money because we didn't have capacity, we didn't have the way we thought, and there's somebody who was rigging the procurement process. We're correcting that. So we're streamlining all these things, and that's what gives me a great deal of hope that we are going to turn this ship around, and we are turning it around. A good example, a very good example, is just the Hamaskral issue. Twelve years, nothing has moved, largely because it's been a respons sole responsibility of the local government. And we say, no, we're changing that. National is now going to intervene. We're going to intervene, we're going to change things, and that's exactly what we're doing now. We're direct, direct, uh, direct, redirecting rather the, the way the budget has been structured, and we are going to intervene directly ourselves. 
the creation of 1.2 million job opportunities, national, has been intervening and saying this is how we are going to do it, rather than just leave it, uh, you know, with various structures and not much gets done. So I would vote for the ANC for that, and that gives me a great deal of comfort. News 24, are you happy with... Oh, dear. I wrote something. I can't read it myself. Uh, oh, yes. Minister's performance. Performance across the board has been improving, notwithstanding the challenges. And I have seen my ministers uh, improving the various areas where they have been deployed. We started off by saying we want those performance agreements, and then I said, I want to meet you all so that we focus on your priorities, and we've done that. And I'm meeting them again and say, I want to see what progress has been made. And it is interesting that each time we meet, new issues come up. For instance, we looked at the Minister, Ministry of Labor, and we said, we were able to navigate our way through COVID by deploying 70 billion, was it 70? Yes, 70 billion rand to show up those who either lost their jobs or uh, had, had job processes where their work stopped or stalled. We were able to support those. But one of the remits of the Department of Labor and Employment is to have labor activation processes. And we've looked at that and said, we need to be creating more and more job opportunities for our people. We have the resource and we can redirect and, and make sure that uh, we create more job opportunities. That's precisely what we're doing. And I do that on engagement with the ministers. Some of it may not be seen uh, in an overt way, but this machine is continuing to work to address the needs of our people, to address them. And as we do that, when it comes to water, uh, when it comes to roads, when it comes, for instance, to the logistics issue, which you cited as well, broken down, being repaired. The roadmap that we've put in place is doing precisely that. So a lot is being done uh, even by the ministers, to reposition many of the things that we're doing. You then say, uh, the SG was complaining about the veterans that they must stop decampaigning the ANC. Uh, the, 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 the SG uh, raises this issue because it's an important one. It's very important. We are We've been saying we're a party that should have one message and we should have as many people as possible to articulate that message. And there must be unity of purpose. I am the first to have said to the national executive, let us have unity of purpose and let us unify the message that we beam out to our people so that we don't confuse them. Our people should not be confused by what we, we articulate. And am I happy about how the SPET has been handled? Yesterday there was an, uh, a statement that came out where Comrade Mavuso um, Simang said he's withdrawing his uh, resignation and the SG also uh, re issued a statement saying that he apologizes uh, for what he said to the extent that it could have been seen as being insulting, undermining. And these things happen in organizations. That is now behind us. We're moving forward together as various components of the ANC, Veterans League, the Women's League, the Youth League, and all of us, uh, we're moving forward as one movement uh, facing uh, the 2024 elections. And that is why we're speaking with great deal of confidence Confidence that is born out of what is happening in our various organizations. We are allied to a number of organizations that are throwing their weight behind the ANC. 
COSATU, the SACP, and indeed the various uh, leagues in the organization, all of us are going to work for the victory of the ANC. And it is for that reason that we say there must be unity of purpose. There shouldn't be those who pull aside and who pull uh, this way.